I go for it. I can send. Um, right. So then I uh, went to the University of Texas to study philosophy of mind. Um, and that's what I did. And then I wrote a dissertation on philosophy of mind. So the first argument I'll give you is actually just a summary of one of the arguments in my dissertation. Um, so that's one thing we're talking about. These days, um, I think a lot about epistemology, which is the study of knowledge. Um, I think a lot about whether religious belief is rational. I've written a lot about um, what to do in the face of religious disagreements, given that there are really intelligent people who disagree with us on religious questions. Does that mean we need to be skeptical? So that's something else I've written on. Um, in the last few years, I've gotten into philosophy of sex and philosophy of gender. Um, I guess I should say philosophy of biological sex, not the activity, but the states of being male or female. Um, so those are things I think about these days. And that brings you up to date. All right. So, um, yeah, at the top, there are a few views here. We can move from, I guess, left to right. So, uh, for all these views, I have a picture of um, a person. You can imagine that's you. And there's something going on in this person's brain. They've got a certain kind of brain state. Um, and so, in the philosophy of mind, here are four pretty common views about how mental states relate to brain states. So, by mental states, I mean things like feeling pain or feeling pleasure, having desires, having beliefs, um, having thoughts and intentions, uh, the sort of mental life that we're all really familiar with. So how does that relate to what's going on in the brain? So um, I guess actually I'll start with reductive materialism, because that might be the easiest one to understand, and then we'll move to a more extreme kind of materialism. So reductive materialism says, you definitely exist, and your mental states exist, but um, this, may, this may be a surprise that they say, but your mental states just are brain states. Your mental states just are brain states. So the love that you have for your family members, that's a state of your brain. Um, the thoughts you're having right now as you think about philosophy, those are happenings in your brain. If you want, you can think of it on analogy with what's going on in a computer. Um, the mind is the software, the brain is the hardware. Whatever is going on in your computer right now, there's something underlying it and explaining it in the actual machinery. So that's what reductive materialists tend to think. So I put a little equal sign there because they will tell you your pain right now just is a brain state. So it's not that the brain state produces the pain or gives rise to the pain. The pain just is the brain state. It's the same thing going by two different names. So an analogy is something like Superman is Clark Kent or water is H2O. These are identities that we've discovered. Well, I guess Superman is a fictional character, but in the story, they discover that Superman is Clark Kent. It's not that Clark Kent causes Superman to arrive. Clark Kent just is Superman um, under a different guise or under a different appearance. Okay, so that's reductive materialism. Um, eliminative materialism is a bit more extreme they'll say that well you certainly have a body um, and there are brain states associated with that body um, but strictly speaking there are no mental states um, this psychological vocabulary that we have is a relic of a primitive time um, and we need to abandon those theoretical terms the way that we abandon to talk of witches and caloric fluid and all those other failed theoretical entities from the history of science that we discovered don't really exist. Um, eliminative materialism says, what we've discovered um, are just brain states. <clears throat> when we opened up people's skulls, we just found that it's just physical stuff going on in there. And what's interesting is they, they have a kind of dualist intuition. They think if mental states existed, they couldn't be brain states. They're just too different. Mental states are just too different to be brain states. So we can't identify them the way the reductive materialist does. So the eliminative materialist says we need to eliminate them. We can't fit them into our physical view of the world, so we need to eliminate them. The way that, for example, maybe once upon a time, people thought that epilepsy was caused by demon possession, come to find out there are no demons involved. So we didn't say, wow, it turns out demons are just really different from what we thought, they're just brain states. We didn't say that. We said, 
if demons existed, they would be so different from what's going on in epilepsy that we should just get rid of this demon talk. There, there are no demons involved here. It's just brain states. It's just epilepsy. Okay, so the eliminated materialist says we should do something like that. Yeah, so I gave you a little analogy there. It's like how we, we didn't try to reduce demonization to epilepsy and say demonization just is epilepsy. We didn't do that. We eliminated demonization. Okay, maybe I'll just stop there and see any questions so far. Is there much time to raise a hand or can you in the Google, uh, Zoom chat speak up? Um, is that clear enough, these two views? I learned earlier in my teaching career, you're supposed to wait 11 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Questions to pop up. Actually, nothing from the Zoom chat. So. Nothing in the Zoom chat. I guess oh, I have a question. So, I guess in the limited is uh, materialism. So, um, every time I'm about to say it, I worry. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to come out. Um, so, what to those people are those feelings? Like, if they can't fit within the materialist, this material, specific materialist perspective, where they they're what what is emotion or subjective feeling to them? Yeah, they'll say, um, well, the only thing going on in your skull is this sort of neurophysiological stuff with neurons sending um, neurotransmitters across synapses. That's all that's going on in your brain. Um, so if you ask them, well, what's a feeling or what's an emotion? Then they'll say, well, it's the only thing going on in your skull is the brain states. Mm -hmm. If you think that there is something in addition or something different from brain states, you are suffering from an illusion. The brain states are kind of tricking you into thinking there's something more. They're like throwing up a fog that makes you think there's something else there. Um, so illusionism is a view in the philosophy of mind that is kind of hit these days on Twitter. Uh, it's basically eliminated materialism as far as I understand it. And they just add the view that our beliefs that we're conscious and our beliefs that there are sensations are um, caused by illusions. Mm -hmm. These brain states are appearing to be something that they just couldn't be. Yeah, so that's what they're saying. Um, yeah, and I mean, a common objection is, um, do you really believe that? Eliminated materialists? Can you really believe it? Because they can't say yes. They don't, <laughs> they don't believe in beliefs. Um, <laughs> so it's like the self-defeating. Yeah, the, here's, a, here's a kind of um, initial kind of flat-footed objection. This is unbelievable. <laughs> I can't believe this. Because if it's true, there are no beliefs. Um, but they have a pretty easy rejoinder. They just say, um, well, you can't believe it, true, because there are no beliefs, but you can brain state 527 or something like that, which is everything you wanted out of a belief anyway, without the um, weird, spooky, extra consciousness bits that don't fit in the physical world. So they'll say things like that. Okay, let me move to the dualism stuff so I can give you a couple arguments for dualism. Um, so there's two kinds of dualism, and the difference between them is, um, well, there's two questions that are answered by all these pictures. One is what you are. What are you? That's one question. Another question is what are your mental states? And I guess I should have added that eliminative materialists also, if you ask them what I am or what the self is, they'll say there's no such thing. <laughs> um, there are no selves. There are no persons. There's no like enduring seat of consciousness because there's no consciousness. Um, and your belief that you exist and have existed for a long time, that is also the result of an illusion. You've been duped. I guess you can't even say you've been duped because you don't exist. <laughs> that the brain, body. There, yeah, they'll point to your brain and say, that brain there has been duped. Um, yeah, the body's been duped, I guess, into thinking that it's a self and it's conscious. Okay, so the eliminative materialist says there are no mental states, also, you don't exist. Um, the reductive materialist says you exist, but you're a body. Um, you are a physical object, and your mental states exist. They are physical states, they're physical properties. Okay, the property dualist says, um, with respect to the properties, the characteristics or the features, pain and whatever sort of brain state is associated with pain. So like when I pinch myself, presumably I go into some sort of brain state that we can see on like a, in an fMRI. So um, that brain state is associated with a feeling of pain, but it's not strictly speaking identical to the feeling of pain. So here you'll get talk of brain states causing pain or pain emerging from brain states. Um, that sort of talk of causation or emergence presupposes we've got two different things here. The pain is one thing, the brain state is something else. 
and the brain state can cause the pain or give rise to the pain of the two different things. So if you believe that, you're on your way to being a property dualist, um, but the property dualist agrees with the, the reductive materialist about you. If you ask the property dualist what you are, they'll say you're, you are your body, you're a physical object, or maybe some part of your body, like your brain. Um, so you are a physical object, but your mental states are not physical properties. There's something new, something that neurophysiologists couldn't study or discover. They could study all what's happening with the neurons and the neurotransmitters and how fast the neurons are clicking. They could study all that, but try as they might, they could never study the pain. And it's just a different kind of thing. Okay, so I'll give you some analogies there. Um, smoke is caused by fire, but smoke itself is not fire. It's the thing. But there's just one thing there, the wood that's smoking in on fire. So the property dualist is saying something like that. Um, the smoke is the pain, the fire is the brain state, the wood is you or your brain. The wood is producing both, um, but the two things it's producing are distinct. The pain and the brain state are distinct. Okay, substance dualism over here um, answers both of those questions in a dualist way. So if you ask the substance dualist, um, is my pain identical to whatever brain state is associated with the pain? They'll say no, two different things. So they are property dualists, but they're not near property dualists because they also say with respect to you or me, um, you are not a physical object. You are something different from your brain or your body. Okay, so I put a little Pac-Man ghost thing over here. It's kind of like a silly way to depict it, but I'm a substance dualist, so that's okay. I can make fun of the view. Um, it's often derived as a, oh, on that view, there's a ghost in the machine. That you believe in um, a self that isn't a, that isn't a physical object. And that's true. That is what substance dualism believes. So the relationship between the body and the mind, or if you like the body and the soul, is similar to the relationship between a driver and a car, or a pilot and a ship. So when you're in your car, stuff that happens to your car can cause things in you. Like you can feel what's happening with the road and the wheel. If somebody hits your car, it's going to affect you. So there's a causal connection from your car to you. Things happening in your car can cause things to happen in you. But it also goes in the other direction. You can cause things to happen in your car. You can steer it. You can turn the blinker on. You can push the gas pedal or the brake pedal. So um, that's substance dualism in a nutshell. You get this two-way causal connection. Okay, those are the views. Now I'll give you an argument for substance dualism. Ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I like a version of what's called a modal argument. And it's a modal argument because it has to do with um, possibility and necessity, with what's possible and what's necessary. Um, and we call those modal verbs. Um, sorry, modal adjectives, modal terms, what's possible and what's necessary. Um, and so this argument for dualism starts with a judgment about what's possible. And so what I tell you here on the handout is mind, um, even hardcore physicalists, materialists, will agree that dualism seems true. And I told you already that the eliminative materialist, the illusionist, agrees that dualism seems true. That's why they want to eliminate mental terms instead of trying to reduce them. Because they think if mental terms existed, they couldn't possibly if mental things existed, they couldn't possibly be physical properties. That's a dualist intuition. Um, that, that, that's what dualism thinks. Okay, um, but even reductive materialists agree that their view is a little counterintuitive, saying that your feeling of pain just is a certain activity of neurons sounds a little weird. So they admit it that it sounds weird. Um, and they agree they have some explaining to do. Um, and I give you some kind of standard thought experiments here that you can think about for yourself to see if you have dualist intuitions. Uh, so the first one I ask you about is just uh, life after death. You ever thought about that? I would be shocked if you hadn't. Uh, your hands? Oh, sure. <laughs> I thought about that. All right. Hold on, let's be real. Yeah, most people are fine. Okay, so when you think about life after death, does that strike? I'm not asking you whether you think you actually will survive the death of your body. I'm just asking you whether you think that could happen. So which category do you want to put it in? Imagine I've got two categories here. 
Uh, in this category, we'll put things that are possible in the broadest sense of possible. And over here, we'll put things that are impossible in like the strictest sense of impossible. So possible in the broadest sense, impossible in the strictest sense. And so if I asked you about um, like being invisible. So as far as I know, it's not possible for like being invisible right now, but that's in this category, right? Possible in the broadest sense of possible. Maybe a better example would be um, jumping over very tall buildings. I cannot do that, and I don't think any human can. But that's a result of like the laws of nature and our limited quads, or something like that, our deadlift limitations. We just can't jump that high. Um, so it's possible in the broadest sense that we should be able to jump over really high buildings. Um, maybe another example is uh, what's a very expensive car? Uh, is a Bugatti a car? Yeah. Okay, so can you buy a Bugatti? Can I buy a Bugatti? But not in this sense of possible. It is possible for me to buy a Bugatti. I just don't have enough money. If I just got more money, I could buy a Bugatti. So it's possible in the broadest sense of possible. Um, jumping over buildings is impossible given my limited muscles and the laws of nature. But if those change, I could jump over the top. Okay. okay. I think you get the idea. Um, over here, we'll put the things that are absolutely impossible, like um, square circles. A figure, like if I challenge you to draw a figure on that board that meets the definition of a square and also meets the definition of a, of a circle, the current definitions, please don't change the definition, right? <laughs> the current definitions, that's impossible. Given what a square actually is and what a circle actually is, you can't have something with both. Okay, what are some other things? Um, what's a celebrity that goes by two names? I don't know. Do you still know about Lady Gaga or is that like old person stuff? No. Yeah. Okay, and what's her real name? That's not her real name. Nope. Real name is Stephanie something? Her Germanata? Anybody? <laughs> Any other celebrities with two names? All I know for my students is there is somebody named uh, the baby. You know? <laughs> It's like, I think he killed someone or something. Um, oh my. I don't think that's his real name. I actually don't know that there's a real name. Okay, so let's just use Lady Gaga and Stephanie. Let's pretend her last name is Germanata. Could it happen that, <clears throat> uh, heaven or fend, God, God, don't permit, don't permit this, dear God, but could Lady Gaga die while Stephanie Germanata survives? I'm going to say no because it's the same person. <laughs> it's the same person. Now she could stop going by Lady Gaga. She could say stop calling me Lady Gaga. Um, she could stop acting like Lady Gaga, um, but she would still that name would still refer to her. Right? The name picks out Lady Gaga picks out one person. Let's pretend this is a person that Lady Gaga picks out. Stephanie Germanata, that name, whatever it is, picks out that same person. So it couldn't happen that this person dies. Well, also this person is alive, right? Because it's the same person. Okay. Um, so that would be in the totally impossible camp. Okay, now here's why all this was relevant. Um, when you think about life after death, which category do you put it in? Possible in the broadest sense, like being invisible, jumping over buildings. She just use unicorns. Unicorns are over here. That's just a horse with one horn. That's possible. Um, or do we put them in a square circle? Lady Gaga dies, Stephanie Germanata survives. Um, where do we put life after that? You don't have to answer out loud. You can answer in the privacy of your own heart. You don't have to tell other people. But a lot of people put it in this category. Okay. Uh, what about reincarnation? I do not believe in reincarnation. Um, by reincarnation, I mean, in my case, this body will be destroyed, but I'm going to get a new body. You might maybe come back. Maybe it'll be an animal body. I'm naughty. But if I'm really good, I'll get an even, an even better body. Just kidding. Okay. Um, so that's reincarnation. And then my question for you is is that possible in the broadest sense possible or is it impossible? I think it's possible. Oops, I answered that one. But you don't have to answer that one. I don't believe that reincarnation will actually happen, but I think it could. It's the kind of thing that could happen. And on my side, I've got like billions of people who agree. Not only that it's possible, but that it's actual. A whole bunch of people think it's actual. Okay, um, so that's one kind of thought experiment. It seems like humans have had no difficulty in 
believing not only that life after death is possible, but that it's going to happen. That's why humans tend to bury their loved ones with like stuff. It was like ancient humans did that because um, they thought you'll need this stuff in the next life. Right? So they thought life after death isn't merely possible, it's actual. Okay, um, Descartes famously thought that uh, for all he knew, he might be disembodied and all of this might be an illusion. You think that's so? Just think, think to yourself is that really possible? Could this all be an illusion and I'm really just a disembodied spirit? Um, Wilhelm Gottfried von Leibniz, um, sorry, Gottfried Wilhelm von Leibniz, famously imagined this. Um, he imagined walking, um, he said, if there were a material object that could think, imagine it expanded to the size of a factory uh, so that you could walk around inside of it. Or if you want, imagine being diminished in size and then going into somebody's ear and looking around their brain. Leibniz, who um, may well have been uh, one of the very smartest humans who ever lived. I'm just going to throw that in there to bias your judgment here. Um, I'm going to ask if you agree with Leibniz in a second. <laughs> he lived a long time ago and he invented one of the first binary computing machines. So then you can play Leibniz. I'm just kidding. Um, this is just for calculation. Uh, so he was pretty smart and he thought that if you could enter into a, a, an, an object like this, all you would see is physical stuff pushing and pulling on other physical things, but you'd never see, he said, anything that could explain a perception. So just or imagine like we're watching an fMRI machine and we see this person thinking about philosophy and we see little bits of their brain becoming more active. The intuition is um, you imagine being told by a materialist that neural activity is the thought that Descartes was right, and the thought that Leibniz was right. That neural activity right there is the thought that Leibniz was right. If you feel within yourself um, uh, repulsion towards that idea, if that couldn't possibly be, that's Leibniz's mail. That's the Leibniz's, oh, by mail, maybe factory, something like a factory. Okay, and then also finally, the just imagine having an auto cerebral scope so you can see your own brain while you're thinking. So you see what's happening in your own brain while you're thinking. And imagine a materialist telling you that brain state right there is your love for your mother. That's your love for your mother. Um, a lot of people, uh, even materialists, respond to these sorts of thought experiments by thinking that doesn't seem right. That seems right. Okay, um, let me just stop really quick uh, again and ask any clarifying questions. This is just step one of an argument for the world. Okay. How about anyone in Zoom? Just to clarify, is materialist kind of like how science views humans? Like it's only like neuroactivity, chemical composition and stuff, whereas dualism is more like the body versus the spirit, or your thoughts are separate from your body and stuff. Is that how it is? Um, so the question was, um, is materialism basically the view of how is materialism basically how science views the relationship of the mind and the body? Um, and dualism is a view on which you've got um, the body versus the mind or versus the spirit. Um, I will say that a lot of materialists, when you ask them why they're materialists, they will say something about science. I'll say, like, science has taught us that this is true. Personally, I disagree with them, and I don't think that science has taught us that. Um, I don't think that there's a good argument from what we've learned by way of science to materialism. But yeah, usually those are the kind of reasons we get. Um, and if you wanted to see one such argument, um, these are supposed to be arguments for realism. Yes. Is it possible that only asking science is taught us, but only saying science is taught us this so they can create a vision of that dose as opposed to actually having it? Create a vision? It's like a pure like that dose without actually having the authority of actually having that dose. Oh. So the question was, might a materialist be- uh, No, might like someone who says, has science science taught us be saying that just for the ethos, even though it might not actually be there? Oh, just for an appearance of authority, you say? Yes. Um, well, it certainly is nice to appeal to science, but when science is on your side, you feel like a boss. Um, so yeah, I guess there's an attraction to having science on your side. Um, but it, I don't know, that's sort of a psychological explanation of what's going on, and it's not a very, Flattery or charitable psychological explanation, they can 
it would be to say to the materialist, well, uh, you just believe that because you're on a power trip or something. You don't have any good reasons, um, but you want to be an authority. Maybe as a matter of fact, that isn't going on, but um, I think it's, I think the place to start is with the charitable interpretation and say, I, I believe you when you say that you think science teaches this, let's look at your reasons. Um, yeah. I mean, if that if dualism is true and pain is not itself a physical property, you might wonder like how science could even tell you anything about it. It would be like consulting science when you're trying to figure out the philosophy of mathematics. That's a, that's a good analogy. When you're trying to figure out what numbers are, do numbers really exist? If so, what are they? They don't really seem like physical objects, but it seems like there's a lot of them. So what are, what are numbers? If somebody came along and said, well, nowhere in the history of science have we ever seen a number, you might like grant that and say, yeah, I agree, but they, they weren't the sort of things I would expect you to have found with your instruments, right? Because they're, they're not physical. Um, and science is in the business of studying the physical world. So there's just a quick, quick something to think about if somebody tries to settle this question just with scientific considerations. I think it'll take a little more than that. Okay. Um, I included a few quotations, including for one from Daniel Dennett, who's a uh, super hardcore physicist. But even he grants that it does seem as if the happenings that are like conscious thoughts and experiences cannot be brain happening, but must be something else. Something caused or produced by brain happenings, no doubt, but something in addition. Okay, so even Daniel Dennett, super hardcore materialist, in fact, I'm pretty sure a kind of eliminated materialist, super hardcore material, materialist says, it does seem that when I think about my own mental happenings, they don't seem like they could be physical happening. Okay, um, Thomas Nadelhofer, pretty sure he's not a dualist. Um, he does a lot of experimental philosophy, which basically involves giving people surveys and asking what they think about philosophy questions. He asked ordinary people a bunch of questions um, to just see if ordinary people are dualists. And I just included one such question um, and the answers that ordinary people gave. And I guess it actually, the question was true or false. Each person has a non-physical essence that makes that person unique. And 81% of ordinary, ordinary people agree that each person has a non-physical essence that makes that person unique. Ordinary people can be wrong. And we probably shouldn't do philosophy by consulting ordinary people. But I'm just telling you that premise one in this argument is Dualism seems true when you think about it. To ordinary people and even to philosophers, everybody kind of agrees dualism seems true. Physicalists say, I, I keep using the word physicalist, maybe you're wondering, is that the same as materialism? Yeah. Okay. Um, so physicalists say things are not the way that they seem to be. We are the victim of some sort of mistake or illusion. But premise one in the argument so far is just dualism seems true, even to materialists, even to physicalists. Okay, um, and then the second step in the argument is, well, if dualism seems true, if it appears to be true, then we should believe that it's true unless we have a good defeater, unless we have a good reason to doubt it. So that's premise two, the apparent truth of dualism defeasibly justifies dualism. By defeasibly, I mean, it's the sort of thing that could be defeated or overridden. Yeah, so I don't know, what's an example of a defeater? Maybe uh, you start getting, signals from a love interest that maybe the person's interested in you and you start thinking oh i think the person's interested in me you are defeasibly justified on the basis of those signals but then suppose you ask the person do you want to go out and they say not if you're the last person on it something like that now the seeming has been defeated it seems like they were into you but now you know they're not okay so that's a case of a defeater so similarly dualism kind of seems true and you might think oh maybe dualism is true but if we got a really strong reason to think it's false that would be a defeater um, what's the case of an undermining the theater? Okay, um, don't do drugs, kids, and I'm not advocating drug use, but imagine that you started seeing what seemed to you to be like pink mice moving up and down the wall, but then you found out that your friend sitting next to you or on that pizza, there were some psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> don't do drugs, kids. Um, drugs Just so you know, the worst psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> this is sounding very persuasive to you. Um, but imagine that happened, like you start seeing things, you're like, oh my goodness, there's like pink mice in the room, um, and you believe that there are pink mice moving up and down the wall, but then you find out that you ate um, some, some psychedelic mushrooms on that pizza. 
Now, what happens to your confidence that there really are pink mice on the wall? It goes down, right? And what happened was you got reason to doubt your vision. You thought your vision was reliable, but now you learn you're on drugs. Can't really trust my vision anymore. Okay. Maybe you can think about examples of, this is called an undermining computer. Um, because it doesn't directly attack the truth of your belief, it attacks the reasons you held it. Oh, yeah, here's another one. So if you yourself grew up religious, or if you thought about religious beliefs, maybe people have told you, well, the only reason uh, people are religious is, um, as Karl Marx taught us, it's the, it's the opiate of the masses, because we find ourselves in unjust economic conditions, and we're part of the oppressed labor class. Um, we comfort ourselves with religious beliefs. That's why we're religious. So I'm not saying that's true. In fact, I think that's false. Um, but that would be an example of an undermining the theater. Karl Marx wasn't giving you a reason to think that your religious beliefs are false. He was just telling you, you don't believe them for good reasons. You believe them because of your economic position, not because you have a good argument for it. Um, okay, do you get the idea with an undermining the theater? Okay, a rebutting the theater kind of directly attacks your belief. So that'd be a case where you start believing that your love interest is into you, um, and then they just tell you, no, I'm not. So now that's just a straight up rebutting defeater. Um, an undermining defeater doesn't directly attack the truth of your belief, it attacks the reasons you held it. And it, that's why it's called undermining, because it sort of digs underneath your belief and then the belief collapses. Your belief was being held up by reasons, and then we attack those reasons, and now there's nothing holding up your belief. So we haven't proven that your belief's false, we've just shown you there's no good reason to hold it. So you should give it up. Okay, so the reason I mentioned this distinction is, so far I've tried to argue that dualism seems true in standard thought experiments. And then step two is, we should believe that things are as they seem to be, unless we get a defeater. Now we know what defeaters are. Let me tell you about some defeaters that um, physicalists have offered. Is there a uh, clock? Mm -hmm. um, it's currently 340. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we'll just do one argument today. Okay. But you'll always have the other two arguments. And you'll always wonder why is Kanye West <laughs> <laughs> on the table? And why is that guy holding a skull? You'll always wonder. Okay. Or if you want to hang out longer, that's cool too. Yeah. Okay, um, so here are some reasons that physicalists have given to doubt our dualist intuitions. So let me maybe pick the best ones. Um, yeah, so I'll tell you about number one. So sometimes physicalists say, well, look, we just shouldn't trust our intuitions. Our intuitions are unreliable. You're having a seeming. It seems to you that dualism is true when you think about it. That's an intellectual seeming. So you're believing dualism because of an intellectual seeming, because it seems true to you when you think about it. But you really shouldn't trust those intuitions. You shouldn't trust your intellectual scene. Um, let me give you some examples that the I thought give. Um, we have markers. Wait, guess who's a good teacher? <laughs> you always have markers. Um, this. <laughs> Okay, um, so have you seen this sort of thing? Uh, have, you, have you learned that one is equivalent to point nine 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 computing forever? Basically? Has anyone not seen that? Do you want to know why really quick? Thank you, Stephen. Okay, I didn't hear about this until I was in grad school, and it was during a Q&A when I was presenting the paper, and someone brought this up as, a, as an objection. <laughs> and they were like, you know how one is equivalent to point nine 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 repeating? I was like, that's an actual. <laughs> like, that's a little bit smaller than that. I don't care how many nines you put there, it's a little bit smaller. Um, so I was wrong, and uh, it turns out it was really embarrassing. Um, here's a quick proof. One third plus two thirds is one. You know that one third is point three 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 three, and two thirds is point six 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 six. Okay, let's add those up. <laughs> and it just keeps going forever. So that's weird. So um, a lot of people, when they're confronted with this claim, like me in that Q&A, 
they they will report like that does not that seems false to me and it's an intellectual seeming i'm having an intuition that seems obviously false that seems a little bit small uh, a little bit smaller than one but come to find out it's true so isn't this a case where my intuitions have misled me uh, my intuitions have led me astray okay so um philosophers like to point to cases like this and say look how fallible we are and of course we all know that we're susceptible to all kinds of optical illusions. We've seen a lot of cool optical illusions. Uh, here's another one that philosophers um, like to point to. They'll say, okay, um, they'll say, uh, hey, everyone knows that parallel lines never touch, right? Think about it for yourself. Do parallel lines ever touch? Could parallel lines ever touch? Um, Maybe you're having the intuition that no, that's impossible. How could parallel lines ever touch? Have you heard this one? Sorry, stop me if you actually don't stop me if you've heard this one before. Just uh, bear with me if you've heard this one before. So most people think, yeah, parallel lines, uh, I'm familiar with those, you know, we do this in math. But yeah, those lines would never touch. That's what it means to be parallel. So we form, we form the belief parallel lines never touch. And then some smarty pants will tell you, oh, what about on the surface of a sphere? <laughs> So that's a sphere. And then I've got like this equator and I've got this like prime meridian kind of thing. And um, look, they meet at a right angle. Okay, now imagine the third line that we don't really have a name for on the earth. We have a name for the equator and we have a name for the prime meridian, but not for this other line. Okay, so these also meet at a right angle. So we've got this line, the purple line, and the prime meridian, they both touch, or sorry, this line, the purple line, and the equator both touch the prime meridian at 90 degree angle. So if you've got two lines and they're both perpendicular to a third line, that means they're parallel on a plane. And so people will tell you, look, these, this line, I guess I'll use a different one. The red line, and the purple line are parallel because there's this third line that they both meet at a 90 degree angle. And yet, aha, they say, the equator and the purple line intersect. So parallel lines can touch after all. Um, okay, so they'll, they'll point to cases like this and say, your intuitions are unreliable. Um, if you had the intuition that Lady Gaga could survive the death of Stephanie Germanotta, or maybe it was vice versa, Stephanie could survive the death of Lady Gaga. Um, I think this is in the same kind of plot. So yeah, you might think that's another case where my intuition led me astray. After you did the water bottle thing, I realized, yeah, if Lady Gaga just is Stephanie Germanata, there are no stick around here looks like Lady Gaga. Okay, there we go. I need so, kick guard with the hair. Uh, okay, sure, we'll go with that. <laughs> so if um, Stephanie Germanata is just referring to this person and Lady Gaga is referring to this person as well, how could that person both die and also be around? So maybe you got convinced there that, oh yeah, I guess um, contrary to how things seem to me, Lady Gaga cannot survive the death of Stephanie Germanata. Okay, um, so uh, here's a quick argument that you shouldn't trust your intuitions. Look at all these cases where our intuitions lead us astray. Our intuitions are unreliable. This argument for dualism relies on intuitions, so it's uh, it's a piece of garbage. This argument stinks. Let's forget it. Okay, quick reply. Um, I think in all these cases, um, it's not intuition that has led you astray. It's um, how you expressed your intuition. Uh, the sentence that you said to express the intuition you were having was mistaken, but the intuition you were having was correct. So in this case, a common diagnosis of what's going on in this case is what people actually consider when you ask them to consider this proposition is they really consider the claim that one is equal to a finite decimal um, with a lot of nines, but not infinitely many. It's long, but it's indeterminate. So if you think about that and you form the judgment that one is a little bit bigger than that, no matter how many nines you add, if it's a finite number of nines, one will be a little bit bigger. You're right. That's true. The problem is most people and me, when I first started, failed to really grasp the infinite decimal. So I didn't actually grasp this proposition. I grasped another one in the neighborhood, 
And my intuition was correct about that proposition. My intuition was, well, that, that proposition is false, that one is equal to 0.999, a decimal of long but indeterminate number. Oh, yeah. But that intuition was correct. I misexpressed it by saying that this is false. But the intuition I was having was really correct. Similarly here, the intuition was about parallel lines on a plane. And that's true, parallel lines can never touch on a plane. I didn't really think about spheres, okay? You, you got me when you brought in um, three-dimensional geometry. Okay, I agree then that you could have two lines, both of which hit a third line at 90 degree angles, and yet those two lines are the Yeah, I agree. Um, but that's not what I was thinking about when you asked me to compare all lines on the charge. So there too, my intuition was reliable. I just misexpressed it if I said, yeah, generally, if you've got two lines intersecting a third at 90 degree angles, those two lines are never touched. Um, it's mistaken to say that generally because three dimensional geometry. Okay. Um, yeah, and then the Stephanie Germanata one, what probably happened in your mind when I asked you, could Lady Gaga survive the death of Stephanie Germanata? Is you probably what you probably imagine this. Could there be somebody who acts like Lady Gaga and dresses like Lady Gaga? Somebody who plays that character, but it's not Stephanie Germanotta. And yeah, and then you thought, yeah, that could happen. But then you misexpress the intuition as saying Lady Gaga could survive the death of Stephanie Germanotta. So the mistake was thinking that Lady Gaga operates kind of like um, a description or an office. We're gonna move on in a second, but I feel like I need to say this. Um, I'm not into comic books. Is anyone into comic books? I, I, but I learned a few years ago that a new series in the Thor comic books was gonna have Thor be a woman. So I was like, what? <laughs> How is that gonna have like Thor's changing into a woman? But I guess what happened was they decided, well, the name Thor picks out whoever can wield the hammer or whatever. And then it was just a different person wielding the hammer and now we're gonna call that person Thor. So what they decided is the, the name Thor isn't going to operate the way names normally operate. It's actually going to be a kind of description. The person who wields the hammer. That's who Thor is. Kind of like a title. It's like a title. Yeah. It's like president. Um, so right now the president is a Democrat. Could the president be a Republican? Well, yeah, that's because the president just names an office or a role. And you can have different people play that office or role. That's not the way names normally work. Normally names like Lady Gaga or Thor or... Thomas Bogardus, pick out one person and one person only, and it doesn't change. It's not an office or a description. Um, so if you thought that Lady Gaga could die while Stephanie Germanata survives, or vice versa, you were probably thinking of Lady Gaga as operating, the name Lady Gaga as operating like an office or a description. But that's not really the way it moves away. Okay, so here too, your intuition didn't lead you astray. The proposition that you thought was true really was true. You just misdescribed it. Okay, so that was a quick response. Actually, that was a response to the first objection. Um, let me give you one other. Let me give you one. We'll do number four here, um, and then if you have to leave, I will let you leave because it's three fifty-four, and maybe some people have places to go. But if you want to stick around and hear a little more about dualism, um, I was late, and that's my bad, and I'm happy to stick around longer. Uh, Undermining the Peter from David Papadou, who's a philosopher at University College London, I believe. Okay, but let me just remind you what we're up to here. I tried to convince you that dualism seems true. It strikes us as true when we think about it. Um, so unless we get a defeater, we should believe that dualism is true. And so far I've told you about one attempt to defeat dualism conditions. I've tried to convince you it wasn't a very good defeater. Okay, here's another attempt to defeat dualist intuitions. Um, David Papadou calls this an antipathetic fallacy because he thinks what's going on is when we consider a claim like C fiber starting is just something that's like a little placeholder that philosophers use to refer to whatever the neural correlate of pain is. Some like scientific sounding description of what's going on in your brain when you feel pain. Okay. So David Papadou thinks that the reason so many people are dualists is 
they consider this claim that pain is identical to C fibers firing. And what happens is they think about pain. And when you think about pain, you get a little kind of faint image or faint replay of the sensation. The way that you can close your eyes and think about a green frog. And maybe, I guess not everybody has mental images. Do you have mental images? I guess some people don't have mental images. Right? I don't know how to kind of read them. Because surprise me. But maybe you, when you think about a green frog, you get a little faint image of green, right? A little froggy shape. Okay. So David Papineau thinks that when you think about pain, you get a little like, you ever think about past mistakes you've made and deep regrets you have in your life? And you get like, oh. <laughs> um, so I'm squarely middle aged, so I have a lot of those. Um, and when I think about them, sometimes I like physically shut them. <laughs> I can't believe I did that. Um, so David Papineau thinks that when you think about pain, you get those sorts of echoes of pain. But when you think about C fibers firing, you just kind of get these little images of neurons. Um, you know, image of brain, maybe in your mind, you think about brains. And so that misleads you because when you think about pain, there's something in, included in that experience that's not included when you think about C fibers firing. And so the, the thought of pain of C fibers firing kind of requires you to project feelings or pathos onto something that seems like it has no feelings. It's anti pathos. That's why this is an antipathetic fallacy to be talking. Okay, so he thinks that's the mistake we're making, but this is this is just a mistake because it may well be that when we use certain kinds of concepts, we get kinds of images and memories that we don't get when we think about another concept. Oh, that just happens with like Lady Gaga and Stephanie Germanata or Superman and Clark Kent. We think about Superman, cape, lasers, super strong guy. We think about Clark Kent, glasses, nerdy reporter. And so maybe that's why in the stories people were reluctant to believe that. Clark Kent is Superman because they just seem so different when you think about it. Okay, so that's David Papineau's um, diagnosis of what's going wrong when you judge the dualism tree. So that's supposed to be an undercutting defeater. He's trying to tell you, yes, follow me again. <laughs> um, he's trying to tell you, here's why you believe dualism. You reject materialism, but for bad reasons. Um, it's this antipathetic cause. So now that you realize that your dualism was based on bad reasons, you undermined or undercut your, your justification for dual dualism. Okay, let me try to convince you that that wasn't a very good defeat. So I say that it over generates the figures. It would, it would require too much skepticism, like an unreasonable amount of skepticism. And I'll just give you one, one example. Suppose somebody tells you that on their view, all is one. Um, distinctness is an illusion. Um, and in fact, when it comes to the mind, everything is really one thing. And pain, for example, just is euphoria. Do you think that the sensation of pain is the same as the sensation of euphoria? <laughs> I think you know. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, no, these are very different. And I'm really confident. And pain is not you for you. Those are different. Okay. But now notice we could, if if we had a good undermining defeater here, we would have a good undermining defeater here too. Because the same thing is happening when we consider this claim, it's happening when we consider this claim. I think about pain and something's included that is left out when I think about euphoria. When I think about pain, I get like the little shudders and winces like when I think about euphoria, I'm like, oh, thanks. So in each case, something's included that's excluded on the other side. When I think about pain, I get the wincy. Don't get that over. When I think about euphoria, I get the, the warm fuzzy feelings. I don't get that over. Here. So if so, the same thing is happening here. That's happening here. That sort of antipathetic fallacy. Something's included when we think about one side of the equation that's not included when we think about the other side. So if that is sufficient to undercut. The belief that this is false, it would also be sufficient to undercut your belief that this is false. But I don't think it undercuts your belief. I, I grant that when I think about pain, something's included that's left out when I think about euphoria, for sure. Still, I know that pain's not euphoria. All grants that when I think about pain, something's included that's not included when I think about sleep punishment. Still, I think it's pretty obvious that pain's not a sleep punishment. Okay. 
So that's a quick response to um, happening. I'm going to give you another kind of counter example. But, I don't know, maybe skip that one. It doesn't really okay, I think we have a couple minutes, maybe, or let me just ask who needs to leave at 4 o'clock? I'm feeling like I need to wrap up, but nobody's leaving. Okay, a couple people are leaving. Okay, there's just a couple people. Everyone chime in if you need to leave. Yeah. Okay. Okay, um, well, I'll just stop and ask do you have any questions or anything? Um, and then after that, if people need to leave, that's fine. Um, I will take your offense at all. Uh, but yeah, let me just stop here and ask you any comments or questions. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, can you tell me your name over there? I'm Ernesto. I'm, I'm the, the president of the club. Okay. Nice to have you here again. Okay. I appreciate your time. Uh, and I guess with some of the questions that I have, I was uh, thinking when. Uh, which one you were going over? Um, I can't remember which one, but so when you were talking about, uh, I guess, the cardinal dualism and how he said that, oh, what if everything, you know, um, what if I'm just like my soul and like I, I, you know, the body isn't here? Does that kind of like argument have a new, like, like is it like revived now with like AI and just kind of like theories of like, uh, you know, we live in a simulation and like is that i guess on maybe i'm not phrasing it correctly is that like a new way to kind of incorporate like dual, that type of dualism into a more ai perspective now um yeah that's a good question so there are like new reasons to be concerned about certain kinds of reductive claims um so there are certain kinds of reductive materialism that i think are really hard to believe like, for example, that pain is identical to a certain kind of brain state. And one reason to doubt it is, as Ernesto said, some people think it's possible, in the broadest sense of possible, that I don't have a brain at all. And really, we can still be physicalists. Don't worry. Don't, don't get scared. We can still be physical. Um, my mind is just like software operating on um, not a brain, but on some sort of physical substrate, some sort of computer. Um, uh, this is all just a big simulation run by somebody interested in that sort of thing, run by Meta, <laughs> run by Mark Zuckerberg. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a brain. I'm just some bits on a computer somewhere. So if that's true, and I really am conscious, which I can check, yeah, I really am conscious, then my feeling of pain can't just be a brain state because I've got the pain, but on this hypothesis, there's no brain state at all. Okay, um, we didn't need AI to realize that this was a problem. And back in the, I think the 70s, people, um, philosophers like Hilary Putnam pointed out that it looks like it's a problem already given what we know about other animals. Um, because it looks like, uh, for example, an octopus can feel pain. I've never tried it, but I guess you can like irritate them. <laughs> and it looks like they don't like it that way. Um, and the reason he chose an octopus, Hillary Putnam, uh, that's a man's name, turns out. Um, Hillary Putnam with one L. Uh, the reason Hillary Putnam chose an octopus, 19. Um, the reason Hillary Putnam chose an octopus was um, those are the closest things we have to like extraterrestrials on Earth. Like they diverged from us evolutionarily a long time ago. They do things very differently from how we do things neurologically. Um, and yet it seems like they still have mental states, just like we do. At least some of our mental states are shared. So it just seems really unlikely that whatever's going on in the human brain is exactly the same thing that's going on in the octopus brain when we both feel pain. So that proves that like my pain can't just be a human brain state, the kind of brain state I'm in, because an octopus has pain too, but doesn't have that very kind of brain state. Does that make sense? If pain were the same thing as the brain state I'm in when I feel pain, then there'd really just be one thing there. So the octopus couldn't have one without the other because there's just one thing there. So the fact that the octopus can have pain without my brain state shows that these aren't identical. Yeah, and we can now think about it with respect to computers. Yeah. Nice question, Ernesto. Okay. Um, do we want to move on to a second argument? Do you feel like you, this first argument, uh, did you get enough of that? With the second one, real quick? Okay. Is it okay if we go for like another half hour? Is that excessive? 
Good things to do. It's up to the students. What's in your life? What's going on in your life? Okay, if anyone uh, needs to leave, uh, they, they can, but I they even want to leave. I know this is very boring. Yeah. <laughs> uh, That's our question. These things are fantastic. I mean, yeah, he's like, oh. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll, maybe we'll, I'll do the Kanye West one. We'll see how long that takes. And then we can just do uh, like Q and A for a while if you want. You just want to ask some questions. Was the Kanye West example done before what happened? Before the mental breakdown? In the yeah. Room? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it might actually be a better example now because we'll talk about like psychological continuity, and it seems like there was a real discontinuity in his psychology. <laughs> Is that bad to say? That's rude. Let's be kind to poor Kanye. He's going through something. He's having, some, he's having some personal problems. He's having some personal problems, yeah. Okay, um, I think one reason I chose Kanye was just like, I found a picture of him as a kid, and then there he is, grown up. And I don't know, there was just like a nice kid picture of a celebrity, it was kind of hard to come by. So that really is Kanye as a kid, um, and you know that's Kanye grown up. Okay, so here's a second argument for dualism, for substance dualism, um, and it has to do with uh, what philosophers call personal identity. Specifically, the fact that your personal identity persists over time and a lot of change. So um, this is not controversial. So I'm just going to ask you really quick at the outset. How long do you think you've been around? How long have you existed? About four or five years. Is it four or five years? <laughs> oh, is it because you think the matter is being cycled out? Yeah. You, OK. Somebody's thought about this before, and probably you revised your views. Most people. You know, when we're reflecting on it for the first time, they think, what a stupid question. I'm 20 years old. I've been here for 20 years. That's what it is. I'm not 20 years old. Uh, maybe you're 20 years old. I don't know. 20. Hey, 20. Good guess. Um, so most people think, however many birthdays I've had, that's how long I've been around. Um, I've been here since the beginning. I was once a baby. I think it was put it that way. Do you think you were once a baby? Yes. I was once a baby. Okay. So there's um, premise one in this argument. You've been around for a long time. In fact, you were once a baby. And I was once a baby. Okay, so you've been around for a long time. Okay, now here's the puzzle. <clears throat> Connie has been around for a long time too. There he is as a little kid. There he has grown up. Here's the puzzle. Something has stayed the same because it's the same Kanye. The same person is there on the left and the right. Very different personality. But it's Kanye on the left and Kanye on the left or on the right. Young Kanye was very different from old Kanye. Young me is very different from old me. Um, so my personality has changed a lot. My psychology has changed a lot. And yet, and my body's changed a lot. My baby body did not look like this. Um, <laughs> but something has stayed the same. And then the puzzle is, what is it that has stayed the same? So yeah, what has remained the same over all these years? So what we're trying to figure out is, what do we put in the blank here? We know that young Kanye is the same as old Kanye. They're numerically the same person. Their qualities are very different. Qualitatively, they're very different, but numerically, they're the same. There's just one person there. Whereas Ernesto and I are not numerically the same because there's two people here. Young me and old me are numerically the same, but qualitatively very different. If you had identical twins, they would be numerically different, but qualitatively very similar. Probably not strictly speaking identical, but really similar. Okay, so those are two senses of the word identical. Sometimes we mean qualitatively identical. Sometimes we mean numerically identical. I'm wondering about numeric identity here. What makes it true that young Kanye is one and the same person as old Kanye? Okay, here are some proposals. And what I'm going to do is um, beat up on all the physicalist proposals. And then I think we're just left with dualism. Okay, so here's a kind of, uh, again, like flat footed. Uh, First, try to give a physicalist answer. Sameness of matter. Um, yeah, that's what happens. It's all the same matter here, just kind of differently arranged. And as long as you've got sameness of matter, you've got sameness of person. But you can see pretty quickly that that's not going to work. Um, and I'll give you two objections here. I say that having the same matter is not enough for person A and person B to be identical. And it's also not necessary for person A and person B to be identical. Let's do the necessary one first. You probably guess that old Kanye has more matter than young Kanye because Kanye, he's bigger. Okay, so it's not all the same matter. And yet you've got the same person. 
So sameness of matter is not necessary to have sameness of person. You can lose a finger and be the same person. Be numerically the same person. You will be qualitatively different, but you can lose a finger and still be numerically the same person. You can like slough off some skin cells and be numerically the same person. So you don't have to have exactly the same matter to be the same person. For this so what would be the qualified thing that would, like what's the line that doesn't make you the same person? Is it the mental state? Or, or like, how much could I lose? Or yeah. Not the same yeah. Yeah. Good question. How much? I know I could lose one thing here, but I keep going. Like this is a horror movie. Uh, how long could it go? Well, I guess eventually I'm gonna die. Right. Uh, eventually, uh, eventually you will kill me. And then the question arises: Like, well, can I survive that? And if dualism's true, I could survive that, and I'm still the same person. Do what you want to my body. Um, I just got martyred. I'm going straight to heaven. Um, so happy day for me and my family. Um, but if I'm not, if I'm not this thing for my body, if I just did my body, then I guess even after you kill me, you might think if my body's still around, I'm still around, it's just I'm not alive anymore. But we're actually kind of double-minded about corpses. Okay, here we are on corpses. Uh, we're kind of double-minded about corpses. Sometimes we say like, I'm gonna go to the cemetery to visit grandpa. But also we say like, grandpa's not here anymore. Yeah. Right? So. With respect to dead bodies, sometimes we think like that's yes, the person just not alive anymore. But other times we think like that is nearly the person's body and the person's not here. Yeah, or what did I say first? That's the person's body. So I guess the person is still here. If you think people are bodies, um, this this person is now just not alive, but very old and decaying. Um, so on the one hand, we kind of think that when we go visit grandma or visit grandpa at the cemetery. But on the other hand, we also kind of think this is just the person's body. The person is really gone. Okay. Um, so Ernesto had asked, how much of my body can I lose before I cease to exist? I, I guess, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I guess what I'm asking is like, not necessarily like the body in, in the mind. So like, let's say like. Oh, how much of my mind can I lose? Like, so if, can I, I was going to ask that too, because you can technically split the neural connection between the right and the other brain and get two personalities at once. Yeah. And, okay. We hang on to that thought so I get to psychological continuity yes. it's going to be relevant there. Okay. So far, we're just talking about saying this a matter. Maybe we agree it's not necessary. I think it's not even sufficient. It wouldn't be enough for if person A, I'm going to like use two hands, but I don't want to beg any questions. If person A and person B, and although I'm using two names, that doesn't mean they're two different people. It's like Superman and Clark Kent, same person, two different names. Okay, person A and person B. Suppose person A and person B have the same matter. It's not guaranteed that they're the same person. And here's a quick reason. Um, suppose God collects the matter that currently composes your body as you molt, so to speak. You know, you're like losing matter and getting new matter. Imagine God's like falling behind you with a little dustpan. Collects, maybe it takes a few years, um, but eventually God collects all the matter that composes you now. And then on the day of your wedding, supposing Gen Z still gets married. Um, suppose you get married one day, and as a wedding present, God reassembles all the matter that composed you when you were 20 as a backup for your spouse. Um, that wouldn't be you. So it would be kind of, <laughs> be kind of creepy. You're getting married uh, in front of the church. And then in comes like this duplicate of you when you were 20 that God reassembled. That would be a good movie for that. Let's do that on me. Um, that wouldn't be you, though, even though it is composed of the same matter that you were composed of when you were 20, it's not numerically identical. Okay, so being composed of the same matter is not sufficient to have the same thing. Okay, what about sameness of body? What if I have the same body, even if my body can like lose parts and gain parts, as long as it's the same body, uh, maybe that's what it takes for two people to be identical, sameness of body. Well, I say that's insufficient. Um, just uh, one quick reason is uh, conjoined twins. Suppose you've got two people that share a body. Maybe we've got two heads growing out of like one body. Or I guess in those Harry Potter books, there was that um, dog, like three heads, is that a thing? Spinburst. Yeah, okay. My daughter is reading them now. I missed it. I'm too old for Harry Potter. I was too old when it came out. I missed it. My bad. But we got one dog there. Um, one body, but I guess how many dogs do we have there? Did you say three? Yeah, it looks like we have three dogs, but one dog body. Yeah, because there's like three centers of consciousness, but one body. 
So there's a quick argument that centers of consciousness are not the same as bodies. You can have one body, but multiple centers of consciousness. Okay, but here's a, maybe a better objection. How about brain transplants? So suppose that uh, we open up David's skull and we open up my skull and then we switch brains. Are you still with me? Where do I go in this story? Yeah, I think I think I would go there, right? Oh, okay. We're supposing we have really good <laughs> doctors. Um, we give Chat GPT a robot body, so it's going to be really good at surgery. And Chat GPT swaps our brains. One alternative is like, um, did you see? I didn't see the new Avatar, but I saw the old Avatar many years ago. The last opened or the one? <laughs> The one with the aliens. Oh, <laughs> and the way they depicted that when they when they plugged the guy into the alien body was they went first person with the camera, and then the camera was like, Whoop, and then like woke up in an alien body. He's like, Whoa. um. So that's how they depicted it. So that's one way it could go if we did a brain transplant. My perspective would switch there, and I'd look down and be like, oh, the baby's body. Yeah. Um, and he'd do the same thing. That's one alternative. Another alternative is I would remain here. But I would have all of David's memories and preferences and so on. Which one do we think is the right way to describe the situation? So I would be like, so on this second alternative, I would still be here, but I would tell you that I'm David because I've got David's brain in here and that brain's telling me I'm David. And I'd be like, I'm only 20, 20 years old. I'm 20 years old. I'm from. San Diego. San Diego. Um, yeah, so I would tell, I would give you David kind of, I'd give you David answers, but it would really be me. I'd just be deluded. Okay, so you understand the two ways to describe the brain transplant situation. One way is we switch places. I go with my brain. The other way is I stay here, but I'll be very different afterwards. What do we think? Which one is true? Who votes first one? Me too. Who votes second one? It's okay to disagree. <laughs> okay. Oh, the first one is after the brain transplant. I I started here, but after the operation, I'll be there. The second option is <clears throat> I started here and I will remain here, but I will be very different mentally when it's over. I'll think I'm different. The way that you know, like if we just switched hands, I would stay here, but I'd have a I'd have a different hand. Be like, well, look at this different hand. Um, so that's how it works with hands, but most people think that with brains, like I would go with like, okay. So if you think that's true, then um, sameness of body is not enough to guarantee sameness of person because that body stays there and this body stays here, but I'm moving. Okay, so persons are different from bodies. Okay, um, I think that's going to be enough for sameness of body. Let's do sameness of brain. I'll just do one. What a fiction to that. <clears throat> so you might think, sure, you've uh, objected to sameness of matter, but nobody really believes that anyway. Sameness of body, let me refine my materialist view. I think that humans are brains. They're not bodies. <clears throat> They're just parts of bodies. They're brains. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me give you, <clears throat> sorry, let me give you the second objection to show that sameness of brain is not necessary. For personal identity, you could survive getting a new brain. Um, and here's one way that might go. So this is from a philosopher named Adam Planinga. But let me warm you up to the idea really quick by thinking about computers. <clears throat> so your computer has a um, hard drive in it. But if you needed to replace the hard drive, here's something you could do. You could get an external hard drive, transfer everything onto the external hard drive, replace the hard drive on your laptop, and then transfer everything back to the new hard drive. So everything that was important about your computer has remained the same, but you have a new hard drive. Let's do that with brains. Maybe one day Elon Musk gets us to the point where you could plug in an external hard drive to your brain and we can actually like transfer all the information to a computer. Um, and then we switch out your brain and like clean it up and scrub it and then put it back in there or put a new brain in there, an upgraded brain um, and then transfer everything back. Do you think you could survive a process like that? Let me give you one more really quick. 
I think this one's a little better. What if we did this? It doesn't involve an external hard drive. It doesn't involve a computer. Let's take your two hemispheres and we'll transfer all the information from one hemisphere to the other hemisphere. It's going to require like moving things around and making new space and rearranging the neurons. But all the information from one hemisphere will put it on another hemisphere. And we know that's possible because if people lose one of their hemispheres early enough in life, the other hemisphere can compensate. And in fact, there have been humans living pre normal human lives with a surprisingly small percentage of normal brain mass. Did you know that? Yeah. Like when they're old enough, neuroplasticity. Yeah, and those are like where. Uh, certain people that had like um, really bad epileptic attacks and it was happening on one side of the brain and cut it off but like it grew yeah. so it so goes back. Yeah, I've heard of somebody who had a condition where like they had 10% of normal brain mass and it was all like around the edges of the skull and most of the skull was not brain. And this person didn't have like a totally normal life, but you wouldn't have been able to tell that this, you just think uh person's a little slow, maybe. but pretty normal life, like held a job pretty sure had a family, normal life with like 10% of normal brain mass. Okay, so let's do something like that to you, but you're gonna get 50% of your brain mass, don't panic. So we're gonna take one of your hemispheres, transfer all the information to the other one, and then replace this one with a new hemisphere. Transfer all the information to the new hemisphere, replace this one with a new hemisphere. Transfer all the information back, everything's how it was when you started, except you've got a new brain. Okay, so that shows that if you could survive this process, but get a new brain at the end, then having the same brain is not required to be the same. Okay, uh, just a couple more, and then I will promise this. Do we need spatiotemporal continuity? I don't, I've never actually met somebody who helped out That's just like a view the philosopher talking about, but I actually don't know anyone. Else. If you want to come back in the Q&A, we can. I'll just tell you about psychological continuity because some people hold that view. Did you have you watched that show Severance? No. It's pretty cool. I think you should watch it. Severance. Severance. Let's tell you briefly what it's about. Because it, I was never very sympathetic to the psychological continuity view, and then I watched that show. And I was like, <laughs> maybe psychological continuity is true. Um, so what happens in that show is they offer as a service to people who hate their jobs to um, sever their brain or something, so that when you go to work. Um, you don't remember your outside life. Um, and when you leave work, you don't remember what happened at work. And so you get a kind of split brain sort of case. It seems as though there's one person down at the workplace. Here's what their day is like. They, the first thing they notice is they're getting off the elevator. Because like, oh, <laughs> that's when their memory kicks in again. And then they work this job at eight. And they're like, all right, time to clock out. And then when they get in the elevator, it triggers a scene in their brain and their memory steps up. And so here's what it's like for what seems to be another person. Um, the first thing they remember at the end of the work day is getting in the elevator and uh, work study. Um, and then when they come back to work the next day, as soon as they walk through the elevator doors, their memory cuts off. Okay. And so when you watch this show, it's really natural to describe it as two people like the worker person and the outside person. Um, so that's basically the psychological continuity view in a nutshell. To be the same person in order to... ...experiences over here, down in the workplace, another set of memories and experiences in the outside world, um, because of the radical disunity of these two psychologies. Okay. Um, so that's the psychological continuity view. And what young Kanye and old Kanye have in common, their psychologies are very different, but there's a continuity here. Like young Kanye gradually became old Kanye. Young Kanye added memories, his preferences and tastes changed. And you can trace. Uh, a lineage from old Kanye to younger versions, and there was this psychological continuity the whole time. That's psychological continuity. Um, I think it's false. Um, one reason is, um, how about amnesia? Amnesia would be a radical break in your psychology. 
Or have you heard of that Phineas Gage fellow? We got that tamping rod through his skull. I guess some people claim it's sort of overstated how different his, how different his, how different his psychology was post traumatic brain injury. But it, you can assume it's pretty different. I guess we have actual like uh, football players whose psychology changes quite a lot due to CTE, mm -hmm. and they get really depressed and suicidal, um, moody, impulsive. These are all characteristics of like traumatic brain injuries. So you can have a really sudden radical change in psychology, and yet same person. If you've taken a philosophy class, maybe you had the experience of your psychologist really suddenly as you take psychology really suddenly. Have any views like, change? Have any? Okay. Maybe that happened to you. If your views change really suddenly, and it's like you're a whole another person. <laughs> it's gone. I'm just looking at battery stuff. But you're not really a whole other person. Your psychology is different, but and it was suddenly different. But you're not really a different person. Okay, and then I was just going to give you one other example. This one's a little more sci-fi. But um, you can imagine a case of fission where we have one person. Okay, this is going to take a lot of like imagination, but could we get to the point where we can like unzip a person, end up with like half a person over here and half a person over here. But then through clever nano robots or something, we, re we rebuild their body really quickly. So they survive this process. Are you with me? Did you know it was gonna be so weird today? This is philosophy, this is philosophy mind. This is a little classic <laughs> philosophy mind. So we do a little bit of fission here and we end up with two complete people. Okay, now the trouble is if we do this right, we'll have both of these people being psychologically continuous with the person. Let's call this person A, and this is person B, and this is person C. Persons B and C are psychologically continuous with person A. They both have ancestors that trace back to A. You've got this lineage of ancestors tracing back to A. So we've got psychological continuity. It's just like old Kanye here and young Kanye here. We can trace back a lineage to the original person. But the same thing happens here. And so psychological continuity, the theory, has to say that, look, person A, person A is identical to person B. Also, person A is identical to person C. But person B is not identical to person C. So this is a problem because this violates the transitivity of identity. If B is the same person as A, and A is the same person as C, then B has to be the same person as C. But psychological continuity, the theory tells you, nope, B is the same as A, A is the same as C, and yet these are different. So there's a cost of the psychological continuity view. You've got to deny the transitivity of identity. Okay, so that's why I reject the psychological continuity view. Okay, and now just to sum up, I think, I think those are really the options. Um, and I don't think any of them work. And so the only option remaining is uh, here's what explains why young Kanye is the same person as old Kanye. You've got the same soul there. You've got the same mind. Some immaterial thing has survived this whole process. None of the physicalist answers seem to work, so it must be a non-physical answer. All right, so um, let me stop there, and if you have any questions or comments, I will take those for a few minutes. Thank you. All right. Well, no, no, no. There's a question with a question and comment. We can clap. We can clap more. Well, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. Later. Yeah. But uh, you were talking about the whole like sneak up the 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 mouse pink mice, yeah. The pink mice. What if I take the psychedelic mushrooms, but then like after the trip, the excitement, I still believe what I saw was real. What is that like in philosophy? Oh, so you know that you were on drugs. <clears throat> but I just I believe it. Yeah, you know, that reminds me. I mean, uh sorry, uh, mm, this is gonna be kind of embarrassing, but um You've heard of this Joe Rogan fellow, right? <laughs> um, he's in the psychedelic mushrooms. Um, but he believes that when he's on these trips, these DMT trips, I should say, it's not just the mushrooms, but when he goes on these DMT trips, he thinks he's talking to like, what, I don't know if he'd say God, but like non-human intelligences. And yet he knows he's on drugs. Here. So I guess there's a real life example of somebody who knows that this is a trip, drug-induced trip, and yet believes that 
really what's happening is that drugs are putting me in touch with an aspect of reality that otherwise couldn't get in contact with. So I guess you could have that sort of view. You think the drugs are like opening a portal to another bit of reality. So the question is, what do we say to someone like that? I guess what I would, here's, I, th I think we could prove it pretty easily because people who take these DMT drugs and go on these trips report back that they learned really profound things about reality and it changed their lives. But I don't know about you, I've never heard what that is. Um, and I, I've heard that's actually a common phenomenon. People go on these trips and they come back and tell you, I learned something so important. But then when you ask them, what is it? They, they say like, I can't articulate it. I can't express it. And that's like a common sort of phenomenon. But they believe that they learned something. It just can't be put into words. It's so deep. Okay, but I think that um, that is the sort of thing you'd expect on the near drug hypothesis. You are just tripping. I would expect you not to really learn anything new. Because like it's, it's just you and your own mind. So you're not going to learn anything new. Um, but it's kind of surprising on the hypothesis that I'm getting in touch with non-human intelligences. There, I would expect them at least sometimes to be able to tell you something useful. I'll just give you one other example really quick. Um, some people complain about um, like claims that Jesus was God on this ground. They say, well, if Jesus was God, why didn't he just tell us about germs? That would have been really cool. <laughs> and, like, saved millions of lives. And all you have to say is there are little things that live on you. You can kill them with soap. Here's how to do it. And that would have been really beneficial. And so they're reasoning in the same way. They're like, look on the hypothesis that he was just a man, you wouldn't expect him to know about germs, so he didn't tell us about germs. On the hypothesis that he was God, it's kind of surprising he didn't give us some more actionable information. So I myself am a Christian. Just, uh, I'm just being vulnerable with you for a moment. That's an objection that people give to Christianity. Um, so I think you can give the same kind of objection to the uh, Joe Rogan kind of person. Is it possible Jesus knew about Jews, but people kept seeing his miracles? Is it possible that Jesus knew about germs? And so, like, he told someone, just wash your oh, hands, and, and they're like, it's it. a miracle. Oh, it's <laughs> yeah, maybe he tried to tell, and people just forgot. <laughs> they're like, yeah, I like the stuff he says about um, humility. I like the miracles. Uh, he said some weird stuff about germs. Don't write that down. That's too weird. <laughs> yeah, maybe that happened. Yeah, he had some weird views about little things on your body. Whoa. <laughs> Don't include that, Matthew. Um, <laughs> I guess that might have happened. Yeah, another thing that might have happened is that um, that wasn't the primary goal of the mission to like improve personal hygiene. You okay. the plague king because he was mad at everyone for not remembering personal hygiene. Oh, like the black plague? You yeah. Mean? I was like, uh, punishment. Oh, yeah. He's like, I told you so. <laughs> no, next time you'll listen. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, yeah, that got a little, got a little weird. Hope nobody's offended. Hope we're all still friends. Any um, questions from the back rows? Okay, questions from the front row. I had a question. Um, oh, it was front of the line. Yeah, it was an objection to against substance dualism from um, a philosopher who believes in souls, but he rejects substance dualism. Um, Alexander Proust. Okay, yeah. um, he argues that it can't be that dualism is true because when we think of like an assault on our body, we don't say uh, this. We don't say it's a property crime. We say I got hurt, like someone violently assaulted me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so David brings up an objection that um, I have heard not just from like uh, Thomists. Um, Bruce would say he's in the higher board. That's what I guess. That's mm -hmm. what I guess. Yes. But I've heard this from materialists too. Um, the view that humans are living bodies, that humans are animals, it's called animalism. I've heard this objection from animalists too. The view, that's just the view that I just am a body. And they'll say things like this. That when you like attack me, yeah, you attacked me, right? You, you like punch me in the arm, you punched me. Um, and they'll say things like, here's something I know about myself. I'm six feet tall. I'm rubber rubber pounds. Um, <laughs> Um, so I know those things about me. I have a height. I have a weight. And when you punch my arm, you punch me. So voila, I'm a physical object, right? My soul doesn't have a height. My soul doesn't have a weight. Um, my, you can't punch my soul. So this proves I'm not a soul. Okay, so just to 
Yeah, so I guess the argument is like, um, if dualism is true, then I don't have a height, I don't have a weight, and you can never punch me. Premise two, I don't have, right. have a height, I do have a weight. You can My God, bro. Uh, so dualism must be false. Okay, um, I guess what I would say in response is I'd reject the second premise that says, I do have a height, I do have a weight, um, and you can never punch me. Or you can't punch me. Yeah, I think strictly speaking, it is true that I don't have a height and I don't have a weight. I know, and that sounds kind of surprising and counterintuitive. Okay. But I'll just say this, um, I'll point out that when it comes to other physical objects that we stand in really tight relationships to, um, we tend to start speaking as though we expend into those objects. And I'll just give you an example, when you're driving, somebody can collide with your car and you'll say, you hit me. Mm. Uh, <laughs> you like that one? Mm -hmm. You hit me. Um, and that's because we have such a tight relationship with the car that we start speaking as though it's an extension of us. Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll just say also on the on the view that you are a brain, it's also true that your height is very different from what you think it is. And your weight is very different from what you think it is. And nobody's ever punched you if you're a brain. And in fact, nobody's ever seen you if you're a brain. I'll just say the dualist is not the only one that has this kind of problem. Mm -hmm. The brain view has this problem too. Because uh, on the brain view, strictly speaking, nobody's ever seen me, which sounds kind of shocking. She uh, she but I think what's she happening here, and this is actually going to be the third <laughs> argument I gave you. We tend to think that um, whether or not you're present in a place can depend on the kind of uh, relationship you have to that place. If you have the right sort of relationship of power and knowledge to a place, then we start speaking as though you're we present in that place. Bad, and it may even be true that you're not present in that place. I'll just, um, I, I haven't done the metaverse because I think it's for like weirdos and nerds or something. Have you done the metaverse thing? Yes? Okay. Well, imagine, I guess the metaverse isn't a great example because that's like a fictional place. But imagine we get to the point where you can put on virtual reality glasses and it's like super immersive and you're controlling a drone in the real world. I remember in that show Modern Family, I don't watch that show a lot, but I remember one time like one of the characters couldn't be at a birthday party, so they put a laptop on a robot, and the laptop was like moving around with the robot, and he was like zooming. They call it, no, just the robot. robot. So probably that wasn't a very immersive experience, but imagine we get to the point where it's super immersive. Um, it would be off. I should just tell you, it's like the Avatar. It's not the hair Alien. That guy. It's kind connected of to that alien body in the first movie, in the first part of the movie, to such a degree that it sure seems like he was out on the brain. Just in the brain. That's oh, yeah. because he was getting information directly through that body, he was acting directly on that body. And so we at least start speaking as though he was present in that body. So similarly, I have that kind of relationship to this body. And so it's very natural to start speaking as though I'm present in this body. Yeah, and in fact, I think that's yeah, I think that's actually true that I'm present in this body. I'm present throughout the whole body because of the knowledge and humor that I have. Okay, yeah. I have a question for that comment. Um, is it possible? Can I borrow this mark? Do you want to see this to be recorded too? Almost. Want me to record you or no? No, no. okay. Is it possible that when people question. talk about this, they refer to students where like this and then like not exactly the same, but much like how the body is split, the rest of things are split and not entirely maintained. You gotta tell me what that says. Oh, um, um, Venn diagram. Yeah. And instead of equal, equal, it's um about equal, about well, approximately equal. Yes, much like how the body part of it is deconstructed, the self is also part of it deconstructed. Would that be better or worse for like the argument? Um. Well, what's what do these words say over here? Which ones? Ah, D DNA. DNA is almost equal to DNA. Self is almost equal to DNA. Not exactly. This way, these two can be different, but also maintain. 
Uh, well, usually with Venn diagrams, what we're representing are categories. Yes. So usually like features, like properties, like you can put all the tall people in this circle and all the college students in this circle, there will be some overlap. So usually in, uh, with Venn diagrams, the circles represent features or properties. And so maybe that's what you mean by the squiggly lines when you say approximately equal. What you mean is share many of the same qualities. But like not exactly. Yeah, and so it will be true that person A and person B and person C share many of the same qualities. Um, so I guess that's just true, but a further question and the one I was interested in is set aside um, set aside issues of their qualities. I'm interested in numerical identity. So let's let's use the like straight line equal signs. I'm really talking about identity. What's going on with identity with these persons? Is A the same as B? Is A the same as C? I'm pretty sure B is not the same as C. So I guess what I'm saying is um, you bring up another interesting issue about qualitative identity. And yeah, there maybe we don't get a violation of the transitivity of identity. That's true. But I don't think that races or negates the concerns about numerical identity. And it still looks like, with respect to numerical identity, the psychological continuity view entails that identity is not transitive. Does that, does that answer your question? I, I, if, yeah, so you're just sort of, it sounds to me like you're saying, let's consider another interesting question, qualitative identity. I think that is interesting. But that hasn't helped us settle the numerical identity question. It's just sort of, it's a um, new question that we might consider. And yeah, true, maybe we don't get a good objection to psychological continuity when we think about qualitative identity. But that's okay. Um, we can just go back to thinking about numerical identity and the objection to reemergence. Does that help? Um, I'm trying to think of an analogy that might be useful. I guess in that case, I would just say that both of them are equal to each other. They're not equal to each other? Well, yeah. the problem is psychological continuity, the theory, looks like it entails that A is the same as B because they're, B is psychologically continuous with A. And that, so the psychological continuity theory says, Person A equals person B, if and only if A and B are psychologically continuous. Well, A and B are psychologically continuous. So, according to the theory, they're the same person. It's just like young Kanye and old Kanye. Yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if you thought about this. Maybe we'll just end with this. Some people wonder whether we could upload our minds into computers. And it seems like they're kind of counting on psychological continuity. Obviously, there's no physical continuity between. They're not going to like switch my brain into a computer. They're not going to switch my body into a computer. What they what they hope to do is get my psychology onto the hard drive or something, but change the substrate, but keep the psychology. So they're thinking of a mind as something like software running on hardware, and they just want to change the hardware. So it relies on a kind of psychological continuity. So just imagine a case like that. I mean, here I think is a real problem, and unfortunately, I think this is a devastating objection to prospects of being uploaded onto a computer. So if anyone offers to upload you onto a computer for a modest price, you shouldn't do it um, because you will not survive. Because, and here's how you can see that. You could just ask them, could, could you do this process twice? And the answer is, yeah, whatever they're gonna do to you, they're gonna like, Scan your brain, see what your psychology is like, and then try to duplicate that on a computer. They could do that twice. And in fact, they may not even destroy you. They could just leave you intact and do it. Um, and then it's pretty clear, all they've done is duplicate your psychology. They've made a machine that's very much like you. But it's not you, obviously, because if you haven't been destroyed, you're right here. And if they did it twice, they can't both be you um, because they're not each other. So I think that's a that's basically the objection. Instead of having like a physical kind of fission case, we just imagine you getting your psychology uploaded twice. Both of the descendants will be psychologically continuous with you, but they can't both be you because there's two of them, but only one of you. Is that kind of like the Prestige? Have you seen that movie? Um, that's the one with uh, what's his name, Wolverine. Yeah. <laughs> Hugh, Jack, Hugh, Hugh Jackman, Jackman and uh, was it Christian Bale? Yes. Well, yeah, yeah, so um, spoiler alert, but this movie is 15 years old or something, so it's too late. It's like Breaking Bad. 
Oh, it's like Breaking Bad. We can tell you how it ends now. Yeah. It's, it's over. Yeah. So in the Prestige, um, yeah, there's like this machine that scans you and duplicates you, a physical duplicate. And then to perform this magic trick, the original is immediately destroyed. Yeah. And then the duplicate is like somewhere else in the room. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, that's clearly just duplication. That's duplication. And that's what's so sort of horrific about the discovery. You realize like every time this guy does the trick, he dies. And I shouldn't even say every time this guy does the trick because this guy is only going to do the trick once. <laughs> and then he's going to be replaced by a duplicate. But that's what's so horrifying about the movie. You realize like these people were so committed to the trick that they just kept killing themselves to keep the trick going on. Yeah. That's basically what it would be like if you got uploaded to a computer. <laughs> I think... With that, yeah, we should probably stop. We can conclude the meeting. Thank, Thank you for your attention. Thanks for coming. Of course. Oh, yeah, take some pizza.